Hello everyone for this second session of this year's Winter Congress. Um, for this one I have three presenters with me. These are Silke, Adrian and Mehdi and they're going, they are all journalists and they're going to talk about Omnisec, InfoGuard and the Secret Service within the Secret Service. Sounds a little bit like James Bond to me but maybe I'm wrong and they are going to tell us, tell me, teach me and tell you about that. Stage is yours. I'm... Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm Mary. I'm a Western Schweizer journalist. For, I'm a freelance journalist for Le Temps and uh, RTS as well. And uh, a bit passionate ba about uh, the secret services and how Switzerland is digging into this mess. Uh, so um, what we are going to talk to you tonight is about the in a story of the crypto AG stuff. I was working on this uh, at the past for, I think, 10 years on the crypto AG stuff and how Switzerland was involved in this um, in this mess until the crypto leaks in 2021. Um, and we were, from the beginning, pretty sure that the crypto AG was just the edge of the iceberg. It wasn't the only company and uh, we just started with basic questions how the secret was kept for so long and uh, it was just the the beginning of the um, of the investigation but it was too big for me so that's why i rang the phone to adrian and zilke in um in zurich to have like a national power and because i was reading what they published before and they were just like the the perfect partner in crimes to investigate the um, the, the crypto leaks. Um, so what we decided is, I mean, just the basic first question is how this, the secret was kept for, for so long. And um, because we knew from the beginning that some politicians knew from the past that crypto AG was uh, infil uh, infiltrated by um, uh, by the secret services. We didn't have the actual proofs, but we knew that the you have that kind of a connection, a political connection, um, trying to to keep the secret. Uh, so we 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 started to to investigate into the the into the Bundesrat, and then we figure out that you have like a, two key persons which is Peter Regli, who was running the secret services from the 90s until, um, uh, until the, the 2000 years. And then you have like Urs von Deniken, who is uh, the head of the, um, of the uh, FedPol. And the two guys were really close friends and they were just like working together uh, as, um, as firewalls. They had the connections with the uh, foreign secret services, and then they decided to uh, they they were they were responsible to give the information to the Bundesrat and the Parliament. So they were both of them were just like really 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 um, uh, close, and they were the only two persons to keep the secrets for ten years, actually. Um, so that's why that we figure out in this investigation that we understand that the Peter Hegley and the Urs von Deniken were, were, um, were the, 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 key, the, key, the key players. And then when you look at, the, at these two figures, you understand also that crypto was not alone. It was like the perfect victim of, uh, of, uh, of all this. But you have like a kind of a connection, a web connections. And uh, Switzerland was uh, really willing to to be the best in the cryptographic industry. Crypto was the best, but the she relied on sisters companies like Infoguard, like Omnisec, like etc. So that was a kind of a in the nineties. It was like kind of a all web and connections, political and um, economical. So that's why. Our second questions raised on the sister companies. 
So Adrian, maybe you you can add some. Um... Thank you for handing over to me. Um, yeah, my name is Adrian. I'm a journalist for the Republic, and I'm sorry that I smashed <laughs> the session before. There was a confusion with the with the links for the sessions, but now we're fine. Um, so here we see, um, as Midi said, it's uh, it's a spider web. There are many companies around crypto HE, and our focus was was okay let's put also spotlight on them so there was omnisec and great duck and what was very interesting for us was basically um infoguard because infoguard is a cyber security company today it's still active it's still it still operates and um yeah so we thought maybe we can find some sources from back then and to reach them out and also yeah, so for, for the record, maybe if someone listens from InfoGuard, um, who is working for this company, everything we say now is really referring to the past. Um, we don't talk about the present. So just for the record, otherwise we get some nice emails on Monday. And um, yeah, so we had a look on InfoGuard in, after CryptoLeaks was out in February 2020. Um, some media outlets like Argaud Zeitung and Inside IT were also focusing on InfoGuard and they basically looked at the company connections based on the commercial registry data. And of course, there was a strong link because it was a sister company of Crypto AG. And also, yeah, so we knew there is a strong link, but we wanted to follow another method. We said, OK, but what exactly was InfoGuard selling? what products were they selling and so we followed a new or our new method it's called uh, follow the technology so we said okay let's see maybe we find something there and then yeah we started with with what we find in the web what everyone does open source intelligence i would say so we found this document uh, from 1993 um from a subcommittee on e economic policy trade and environment there were some Swiss companies listed, which were for like uh, strategic interest um, in the commercial um, encryption market. And you can see there is also ETH Zurich listed and there's also InfoGuard listed. So we thought, OK, they they were in the spotlight of the United States, in the focus of the United States. And of course, if you start to um, to make some investigations about this topic, you end up here very quickly on Crypto Museum, which is the Wikipedia, I would say, for <laughs> everything about encryption, was super valuable. Um, yes, basically the first three paragraphs you find there and also in Operation Rubicon were kind of made some some strong claims, I would say. So you can see InfoGuard became a joint venture between Crypto HE and ASCOM. Um, you also can read, um, you can read that uh, it was decided by the CNA and BND that InfoGuard would sell readable equipment to all customers with the exception of Switzerland, Germany, Sweden and commercial banks. So you can see some, they made some strong claims about uh, what InfoGuard was supposed to sell. And readable equipment means um, devices with um, no, but with weak, weak encryption algorithms and probably also some backdoors installed. And there was also, you can see there is on two, a little um, footnote. If you go on this footnote, you can see that they say in practice, in practice, no exceptions were made. And InfoGuard even sold readable equipment to the three accepted countries. So what do we know? We know that Switzerland was also a customer and also got some readable equipment. OK, then we start, we thought like, OK, we need to contact now the authors of Crypto Museum, which what we did. And uh, that was and still are Paul Reubers and Mark Simons, both self-employed engineers from the Netherlands. They were really, really helpful. They also got a copy from the Minerva document. But they were not supposed to share the document with us because it stays among a small circle of journalists and some institutions and some scientists something i personally criticize a lot because i think it's in the interest 
of the public to get the copies out or to share it at least with some other journalists as well. But we got what we wanted at the end. We got from different sources the paragraph about what is like the paragraphs on in the Minerva document about InfoGuard. So what was the plan with in, InfoGuard at the end? Okay, so the plan was to sell readable equipment, but we didn't know exactly what. You also find something about that on the cryptomuseum.com about this um, uh, about this chip theory, HC3400 <laughs> readable drop in crypto chip, and they say it was his, it was decided that InfoGuard would sell crypto enabled radios, um, and that they would contain crypto HE's drop in crypto chip. So okay, we thought. We knew now there is this chip and there were these devices and InfoCard has to sell that. But we were still thinking, okay, we need more proof. We need more evidence. And so we were lucky because in the end of October, there was this um, program of the Dutch magazine Argos from the investig investigative journalist Hoop Jaspers, who basically could prove that these... Um, that these chips were implemented in this crypto enabled radios and also that he could show us which kind of model it was se660 um and also we figured out that these um these radios basically were that the hardware was from ascom and so in so it has to be an infoguard product at the end which was also proven by uh, Hubi Aspers as well, and also by Jörg Spöndli, the leading engineer we were talking to later. So you can see that in these three paragraphs that these um, radios, radios were also sold to, yeah, to the UN court as well. So yeah, at the end, we reached out um, Mr. Jörg Spöndli himself. He was also willing to talk to us. And uh, he confirmed that they were engineering this this series of uh, 660 um, crypto enabled radios. Sorry, this, all these expressions are kind, were kind of new to me. Um, and he also said that he had to design and develop the previous model of this um, of this drop in chip of this crypto chip. So he was not involved in this one, but he also said that the previous one also contains a weak encryption algorithm as well. And when we when we asked him, okay, what do you think now about the three four zero zero series chips? He said, "Die wurden damals bei der Sprachverschlüsselung eingesetzt. Ob die sauber waren, da will ich meine Hand nicht ins Feuer legen." We got later from another source um, some paragraphs from the BND papers where, um, yeah, where it was clear that this topic about Infogard was a hot issue between the CIA and the BND because it was all about the question which kind of products should be delivered to Switzerland, Germany, France and Sweden. And at the end, as we know, the CIA won the fight. Um, so except the banks, everyone should get readable equipment. It was the end of the Cold War, uh, a new era starting. And yeah, so we know now, I mean, eavesdropping and, and siphoning and surveillance is now kind of in some commercial products the standard unfortunately but back let's go back to the 1988 or the end of the cold war so between 1998 and 1999 sorry these three years we know now that it was the intention that infoguard should deliver and sell these kind of products to commercial customers that was the purpose that what that was why InfoGuard was built for. We unfortunately don't know the who were their customers. So it was always said KMU and banks and so on. And also we heard from other sources there was about some uh, chapters of foreign countries uh, from hostile countries, like no, foreign companies from hostile countries. But we still don't know the real targets. So that is um, where an investigation has had to stop. Um, we know that InfoGuard was 
we, as far as we know, InfoGuard was not active any more than after that until 2001. So it was basically only registered in the commercial registry data, but it was not active. In 2001, there was a reset. So the whole era from 2001 to 2018, where there was the management buyout, um, we just heard hints and stuff, but there's nothing proof, no evidence, nothing we found. And yeah, today they are a cybersecurity company, so they changed their focus more to consulting. And uh, yeah, so the remaining question was a bit uh, why um, why did the Runchau uh, SRF not report on that? Um, yeah, that was a bit a question. So I think, or we can discuss that later. I think there's also because InfoGuard is still active and they also have their watchdogs and try to a bit, uh, yeah, to intimate the journalists as well. But yeah, we went out, we published this piece because we thought this the public needs to know that. And we published this piece at the day of the presentation of the GPDEL report. As you see, this is Alfred here, who was presenting that in November 2020. And yeah, to put the spotlight on, and there's the press conference, and the story continues here, so I hand over to Silke now. Thank you very much. Um, I just quickly switch the slides um, in between. Um, yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah, uh, an, an, another man in a grey suit. <laughs> um, yeah, um, my name is Ilke. I'm, I'm a part of the trio uh, that Adrienne, Midi and I formed. Um, I'm a investigative reporter based in Zurich. And um, Midi already said it. You called us on um, to join forces and we did so. Um, and one of my tasks was indeed to focus on another company um, that we looked into of the whole network of the companies and it all started it all became evident what this company played a role in um, on november 10th um, during a um, uh, during a session by the swiss um, that was transferred to the swiss parliament channel on youtube so it was shortly after um, 3 p.m. when the camera pointed at this person that you're seeing here, Mr. Waltzman, a member of the Council of States um, and also party member of the SVP, um, wearing his neat gray suit and his, uh, don't forget to look at his golden bernies bear in the buttonhole. Um, and he read from his notes um, saying, um, during our investigation, we were assured that the devices purchased from Crypto AG were systematically checked and that the Swiss authorities had never received weak encryption devices from this supplier. On the other hand, defective encryption technology was proven in the devices of another supplier. Um, and obviously, um, you, Adrian, Midi and I, we were listening, we, uh, so we tuned into that YouTube channel um, and we did so along with many other investigative reporters and viewers. You can see the over 2000 views there that were registered by YouTube. And we since pursued that question of which company this could be, because it, um, and during that meeting, no name, no name was put out there. And we did so for one very simple reason, because the implications are huge. According to this report, that was then presented by this uh, parliamentary commission. It is about a Swiss manufacturer that supplied um, in, um, uh, in, in, in translation unsafe equipment to the federal government and to two large companies. So we already knew that, that there is a company out there, name wasn't stated, we knew what this company did. So it was about us um, to do the reporting, which we did um, through different methods and eventually we solved it. So at the very end of November, Alfred here, the president of the GPDL, he had to confirm to Republic, Le Ton and Rundschau and other colleagues that it is the Swiss company called Omnisec. Um, we published our findings by the end of November, along with our colleagues from the Swiss broadcaster SAF, um, specifically the Rundschau, a Swiss, mag a Swiss SAF news magazine, um, and reported on it. 
that Omisek is said to have supplied several Swiss security agents with insecure machines. And on top of that, according to Rundschau investigations, UBS, the Swiss bank, is, is or was one of the companies mentioned to have bought manipulated devices. It's important to note for us um, that years before, in 2013, um, the Swiss weekly Die Wochenzeitung Watts had already reported on Omnisec. And the reporter Daniel Stern um, interviewed a range of men involved in Omnisec and he collected information from commercial registries and he followed the money to some Caribbean islands and to the Wall Street in New York City. And what he also did he tried to talk to Uli Maurer, a, a then professor and still today of cryptology at ETH Zurich. And we basically followed Daniel Stern's lead. So we also uh, followed the money to the Caribbean islands. We also went to Wall Street. We also contacted lawyers in the US. We talked to a whole lot of different men involved with Omnisec or being familiar with Omnisec. And we also contacted the professor of cryptology, Uli Maurer, at the ETH Zurich. Because we knew that he, Uli Maurer, had acted as an Omnisec advisor from 1988 to 2015, so basically only recently. Well, we got um, from both Uli Maurer and ETH Zurich were lengthy statements. They wrote a lot but said nothing. Thus, their roles remain unclear, which we also try to make very clear in the report we put out there by the end of November called Das Innerste Auge, the inner eye. Um, what became very clear when reporting and then publishing this um, investigation was the deeper one digs, the more evidence can be found that Switzerland, on the one hand, profited as a free rider from worldwide wiretapping operations, but on the other hand, was also a victim of espionage itself and by Swiss companies. Thus, not only did Crypto AG sister company Infogard that you, Adrian, did talk about, originally have the mandate to sell manipulated devices to the private sector, it is also clear that the encryption company Omnisec, which until then had maintained a very clear image, um, helped to eavesdrop on the Swiss state. And this is only possible because we went in our work, we collaborated, we used methods of open source intelligence to collect information that was already out there, e.g. Um, reported by our colleague of uh, Die Wochenzeitung, Daniel Stern, because we mined data as much as we could mine people and because we followed the money, as you rightly put it, Adrian, as well as we followed the technology. Nevertheless, there are still questions which remain. And those are, who was the other large company affected besides UBS? We have no clue up until today. Well, maybe we have clues, but we have, don't have evidence, put it that way. We don't have evidence. We're lacking in evidence. Why did the Federal Council continue to acquire Omnisec devices despite these incidents? Was the government, the Swiss government, um, the Swiss national government, was this eavesdropped on? In which service um, was Omnisec acting? Was it really the Americans or also other foreign intelligence services who ordered them to do what they did? And again, what was the involvement of the professor and the ETH theory? All in all, we believed, and we made this point very clear end of November, and still it hasn't changed. There is enough material out there uh, which provide more than enough information for an in-depth investigation um, but this is up to politics, and apparently, for now, they haven't acted yet. Thank you very much. Well, I don't know. Well, thank you for this insights. I'm not <laughs> sure if I really wanted to have it. Now I know the, the world is not a secure place anymore. Well, it probably hasn't been. So for the people in the listening um, live, um, you can ask questions in the in the chat. Um, maybe I start um, with one of mine. So first, and obvious, maybe I said already, but I missed it. Um, so if there is weak crypto, 
who would have interests in having that? I mean, it makes only sense. Well, well, there are two ways to deliver weak crypto. One is because you don't know better, and the other one is because you want to be able to listen, right? So um, do you have clues, or does it become clear who would have interests in weak crypto in that sense? Um, yes, I mean, it, it, it depends. I mean, you have, you, you really have to go back to the, uh, psychology of the, the countries at uh, the Cold War. I mean, it's a heritage. We can really, really clearly see in our investigation that you have like a heritage from the Cold War. And then, um, it depends of the state and the relationship and it's like diplomatical. So it's a mean to make pressure or to, 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 to give orders. I mean, if the CIA or the NSA is asking crypto AG, yes, we need to target these countries. Maybe this, this company will cooperate, but it's, it's, um, it's right for a certain time in a certain context, then it can, it, it can switch. But I mean, the mean, I mean, the link between the company and the, um, and the, um, and the NSA or the CIA is still there. So you have a kind of a relationship, which is kind of a ambivalence. It's not like a, we are good friends. We are working together. It's, it, it's more depending of the countries of, and the, the, the interests, I would say. You know what and, you and yeah. And to add on that, I mean, this is something that we have been told from various sources, if you would like to, you know, be invited to the table um, as a secret service, um, especially as a rather small secret service of a rather tiny country, you have to bring something as a gift, so to speak, to the table, um, or not maybe not as a gift, but something to trade. And your currency is not money, your currency is information. So even though you as a country or as a secret service of a particular country might not be interested, maybe your partner is, and that is the, the gift you can give or the good that you can exchange. And what, what happens from um, what we understood from um, our sources is that the, the relationship between Switzerland and the, the CIA is not a honeymoon. I mean, they, they are not friends. I mean, they just want, I mean, if Switzerland wants to trade some stuff, as Zilke did, um, just, uh, just said, or want to protect their interest, she has to. She has to give something back. And it's not like a really uh, equal relationship. It's just like, okay, we have this, you have that. And you you try to you try to 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 dig your uh, your journey into this. I mean, it's the same as the, the the political reaction. I mean, you cannot say this is wrong, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You you really have to be in this balance of protecting interest and then, of course, open up to something different. Yeah, and to add on that as well. Uh... You can see in this first um, document I was showing about uh, the export, like from this committee, you can see that um, there's, in this document is also mentioned that Switzerland was also always was already manufacturing like some of the AT and T telco uh, company stuff devices uh, already facsimile devices and. And then they were also asking themselves about why Switzerland, and it's also because of the export res restriction rules, because there were no like strict rules about that. They never were. They're still somehow not, I would say, they're still not existing. But that was actually because of the du dual use um, uh, regulation in the United States. Basically, Switzerland had also this part to yeah to design them as well. So there was already a strong link you can see in the 90s 
But yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Why weak encryption algorithms? I mean, Omnisec was supposed to be a Swiss company and Swiss, 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 Swiss. I mean, the, the Swiss label was very strong and emphasized. And if you talk to the manager and ex-manager, they always said, no, we had all these audits all the time. I mean, our, our products were clean and then they have one-time use keys and all that <laughs> yeah so it's still a bit unclear in which for which services at the end they really were work, working for i mean there's a hint to the cia but we just see there were weak products um so when you're emphasizing now the the swissness of these companies and since they are also were doing harm to the swiss state so there is one question here in the chat um, if if it would be possible um, or if they are punishable here in Switzerland since they harmed the Swiss state. Do you know? <laughs> no, since we do that, I mean, we, obviously we saw, we, we have hints, but not yeah. obvious enough evidence that we feel that we felt this is um, something that is ready to go public. Um, yeah. um, and thus we cannot elaborate on if it proves to be the case um, that those companies, that Omnisec has deliberately um, acted as, in, as a service, in service of um, some foreign agency. I mean, and, um, I, I, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I, I mean, the um, InfoGuard or Omnisec, I mean, we ask us the, the question whether they are victims, uh, whether they were bribed by the CIA or, or just like um, uh, trying to collaborate actively with the CIA. So you don't really know this, uh, this stage of collaboration and um, maybe they, they have to, to keep up the business as well. So, um, or maybe they didn't know it could happen as well. Yeah. It's the picture is not as clear as we wish it. Um, I have to... to interrupt you since we're running out of time. Uh, Sorry. Actually, the Slack or not the Slack, the channel here it would be full of more question for you. It's a super interesting topic which seems to also raise even more questions. So, are you somewhere reachable during Winter Congress um, where people can ask you? Can you? Will you know, or can you tell us how, how we can reach out for more questions for you? Well, can we have some virtual separate room? Yes, <laughs> I don't you know. can. Well, <laughs> you, we can, you can go on the virtual world. Okay. But mm -hmm. we discussed this before that you said you haven't not tried out. So it would be very cool since there are so many more people if we could, ver mm -hmm. if we could meet in the Winter Congress world in the lounge to keep on discussing. All right. But that's that's the lounge. Yes. And okay, I'll do get that. All right. Okay. Then well. see you there in a minute. And thank you everyone for watching. And thank you again for you for the talk. <laughs>